Uh, my name is Jacqueline. I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us today, and really, I'd like to thank uh, Captain Rafe Arnett for coming in and giving us this wonderful presentation. Hi, my name's Rafe, and I'm uh, with the Midway Speaker Bureau with Ian. I think I recognize a few. I was here a few months ago. Also, a docent over at Midway. And uh, you know, what is a docent? Well, on Midway, a docent is simply a tour guide who docent get paid. So there's, there's about 400 of us. I really like to say we come to work on Midway. It's more accurately described as adult daycare for old guys. You know, to get out of the house, honey, go to Midway. So, and please keep me on the old saying that you get what you pay for. Since they don't pay me anything, don't be expecting a whole lot, right? So, anyway, as we already mentioned, the uh, naval aviation actually started about 10 years before the first carrier was built. So it, it had been in for some time. Now, uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush was well qualified to write this uh, pre preamble to a book that came out in 2010 uh, before the centennial naval aviation on carrier. And because uh, he was the first, he was the youngest ever naval aviator, 19 years old in World War II. Wow. And actually, the first, uh, the first landing on a, on a ship was done by uh, a, a civilian pilot. Uh, Lee Eli, and they, they, they built kind of a makeshift wood pattern uh, platform up on the uh, cruiser up in San Francisco Bay. So he made that uh, first landing up in, uh, oh, up in January of uh, 2011. And then the uh, Curtis, made, uh, who had a big, uh, Wayne Curtis was out here in North Island. He had a naval aviation school or an aviation school. He made the first hy hydroplane flight here in San Diego Bay, which really showed the applicability to uh, naval aviation of airplanes. So the real, uh, and the first naval aviator there, you can say was Theodore Elson shortly after that in January, but then the May was the actual birth of uh, naval aviation. Uh, it was the first, uh, the way they came up with that, they said, well, this is when we came up with the first contract specifications for the first airplane. If you see the first airplane came along there about two months later, so that tells me they pretty well broke the contract for the airplane that they wanted to buy out there. It doesn't seem to work like that today. Then you can see the first uh, combat mission. This was down in the Mexican War, Veracruz. So naval aviators actually just an observation flight down there in 1914. And then we had our first uh, ace, uh, naval aviation ace. It was actually during World War One. He was flying for the British flying uh, Southwest Camels there in uh, 1918. America's first carrier, as mentioned, was the, uh, was the Langley. It was actually converted from a coal carrier, the Jupiter. Uh, it was called the Covered Wagon, as you can see. You know, When we commission carriers today, or any ship for that, it's usually a pretty big deal. You know, the, uh, the politicians all show up and they, they, you know, they have the champagne that they break over the bow. When the Langley was commissioned, the first commanding officer didn't even bother to show up. How much you thought of that, <laughs> but uh, and I can kind of understand that if you can see how do you drive a ship like this? You know, it's in the covered wagon. He's somewhere in the front up there, underneath of everything. Actually, couldn't see very well because all the dirt is holding up the flight deck. So he had to have spotters out there to tell him uh, if he was going to hit or not hit. And back on the back of the, of the uh, carrier there were pigeon coops. Now, why would you possibly need pigeon coops? Well, planes in that era were not particularly uh, you know, trustworthy, and a, a forced one landing was not that unusual. So a pilot would check out the pigeon and take it with him, and then if he had to land the water, he could uh, launch the pigeon you know, with a message on it. Now, they kind of forgot one thing, though. These pigeons were actually trained in Norfolk. So <laughs> one day, one of the officers thought it'd be a really good idea, it's probably bubbles here, to open up the coops and let those pigeons get some uh, get some exercise. Well, before too long, we got a message here from Norfolk said, hey, your pigeons are all there. <laughs> well, we don't have any pigeon in there. Any, any food for them. So, the Langley was uh, was key. The first, the first uh, carrier landing was on the Langley, and then the first uh, catapult launch. Now we have cat catapults. We think today of big steam power things. The catapult in that day was just a kind of a trolley assembly. It had no power of its own. It was just a uh, seaplane up there, and so it used the power of the plane to actually launch off off the Langley. The first is what you might call real carriers, and carriers are named uh, for classes by the first carrier uh, in the class, so whatever that name is, and that applies to the class. In this case, it was the Lexington and the Saratoga, 
They were built on uh, battle cruiser hulls, so they were the largest carriers during World War II. In fact, uh, they were largest until just after the end of World War II when the Midway and the last came in. So they're fairly fast. They were very, very important uh, to us throughout uh, the war, with the exception of Lexington, who actually was sunk, the first carrier to be sunk during the uh, Battle of the Coral Sea. Uh, the Saratoga survived the war. She was torpedoed several times, heavily damaged, repaired, and then she was heavily uh, damaged off of uh, Iwo Jima by kamikaze suicide bombers. But she was repaired again, but then she met her demise about 1947 out of Bikini Atoll was one of the target ships for the nuclear tests. The Ranger was actually the first uh, carrier to be designed from the hull up as a carrier. And you can see it's pretty small. One of the things you'll notice as we go along carriers, it seems like we're getting bigger and all of a sudden they get a lot smaller. And you can see that in, in the case of the uh, Ranger class here. She was actually too slow to uh, be uh, operated in the Pacific against the Japanese threat. So she spent most of her life in the Atlantic, uh, where, where the threat against the, the German was not as bad on the seas. But then she wound up being sunk back in the Pacific, uh, was bombed by some uh, uh, land-based uh, Japanese bombers when she was trying to transfer some airplanes down to Australia. The Yorktown class was, was a class that, uh, did most of the fighting for the Navy in World War II. So there were three of the class, the Yorktown, the Hornet, and the Enterprise. The Hornet was the one that had the 25B, uh, 16B-25s that launched the Doolittle Raid on Japan. And the Enterprise was with it uh, to provide a cover since uh, she couldn't fly any of her own airplane with them on there. The uh, Yorktown wound up being sunk in the Battle of Midway. Uh, she, uh, but uh, Yorktown had an interesting history because in the Coral Sea battle, they thought the Japanese thought she was sunk there. In fact, they were certain she had been sunk. She was repaired in uh, the Battle of Midway. They were thought she had been sunk once because uh, the pilots reported back that she had been sunk. She was actually still uh, afloat, and then she was sunk uh, on the second attack in the Battle of Midway. And then just confused them more with building another one called the Yorktown. So uh, the Japanese were pretty confused about how many Yorktowns the US <laughs> ran, ran around with. The uh, Enterprise was uh, was the most, uh, it was in every battle in World War II, so she was the most decorated ship, with the exception of the Battle of the Coral Sea. She just couldn't get there in time after they launched the uh, new little raid. So the Battle of the Coral Sea, I mentioned this, the first naval battle between carriers. It was the first battle in history in which the naval, uh, you know, the fleets did not come in sight. They probably should have because they passed within 70 miles of each other one night, but uh, you know, it was back before, before you had much night capability. The, uh, now in Australia, they remember this because the Japanese were trying to take a little town, Port Moresby or New Guinea. And if they were able to take that, they were gonna be able to sever the sea lines of communication between the US and Australia and isolate Australia, possibly leaving open to attack. So the Aussies really remember this. So uh, one of our docents over on Midway, we've got a couple that are still World War II veterans. He was down in Australia uh, before COVID, and he said, as soon as they found out you were a World War II vet, why your drink never went empty. So he may, he may go back again. We'll have to see. The uh, the results of the Battle of Coral Sea were. They're called a tactical victory for the, for the uh, Japanese because the ship sunk. The, uh, the election went down and it was really due to uh, error more than anything. She was heavily damaged, but they had it pretty well under control. Uh, but was part of the damage was the aviation fuel tanks and the fumes. The aviation fuel was very volatile. The fumes got out. There was an electrical generator that should have been shut off and wasn't. And so the sparks from that generator set off the, uh, set off the fumes and that uh, doomed her uh, when she went down there. Like I said, the Yorktown was heavily damaged for the Japanese. They only lost one light carrier. One of their heavy carriers was heavily damaged. The second wasn't damaged, but it lost the majority of its aircraft. And the, the, and the Japanese trained their carrier and their group together as a single unit. So these two carriers were not going to be available for Midway, which would turn, to, turn out to be critical. So when it comes to Midway, they're only going to have four rather than the six that they had at Pearl Harbor. And the time, the turn of the tide, or they call it the turning the tide in the Pacific, was the Battle of Midway. Of course, uh, we had an advantage in that our uh, uh, our code breakers were able to decipher. Now, we, we say they deciphered and read the Japanese code. That's a bit of an overstatement. 
they could only intercept about 60% of the 500 to 1,000 messages a day. In any given message, they could only break out about 10 10 to 15% of the message. So they had to do a lot of guessing, but it turned out to be very good guessing because we knew when the when the uh, Japanese carriers were coming, we knew when they were, uh, you know, what their force was basically, and so that way Admiral Nimitz was able to set a set a trap for them. And it really came down to some of the uh, some of the uh, tellings of the Midway story make a lot of uh, about the overwhelming odds that the U.S. faced, and if you count ships, that would be true. Uh, the, the Japanese sailed 157 ships. The, the U.S. sailed at sail 33. But when you get right down to the Japanese, the split their fleet, and so when you get right down to the ships right around Midway, it really came down to, the, the numbers were pretty well even, came down to four Japanese carriers versus US, or three US carriers, and Admiral Nimitz considered Midway Island with its over 100 aircraft his fourth unsinkable carrier. Now the Japanese did out Admiral us. Uh, the Japanese had 28 admirals in their fleet, and we had four, and we won. So maybe there's a lesson there somewhere. We'll have to, I don't know, Adam, what do you think? <laughs> but as you can see, what was sunk there? The York Town was finally sunk. The uh, Japanese lost a four of their carriers. And so from, from that point, the tide had really turned. Uh, the Japanese, they still were a, a potent fighting force. But from now on, uh, they would be on the defensive. And the U.S. would determine when and where uh, battles would be fought for the rest of the world. The next major uh, carrier battles were Guadalcanal, and these were both in Guadalcanal. The first one over there in August was when the Japanese, we'd already landed and taken Guadalcanal, uh, and they were going to try to throw us back off there initially. So it was a major carrier battle. The uh, Japanese lost a, a significant number of aircraft uh, and aircrew, so it was considered a victory for the U.S. Now, later on, you see two months later, was another battle where the, uh, the, uh, the Santa Cruz Islands and the Japanese, once again, were going to try to throw us back off of Guadalcanal. In this case, two Japanese carriers were damaged. Uh, they lost a lot of their senior aviation uh, admirals and whatever, a lot of their senior leadership. And the Hornet was sunk and the Enterprise was heavily damaged there. But it was a, so it was a tactical victory for Japan, but still, it was, uh, we managed to turn back. They did not take Guadalcanal. You know, if you talk to Marines, they will tell you that the Navy just kind of uh, dumped, the, uh, dumped the Marines ashore in Guadalcanal and sailed off over the horizon and abandoned them. And there is some, some truth to that, okay? Uh, but uh, you know, the, what's well documented is the, uh, you know, the horrendous conditions under which the Marines lived and the battle with which they fought. But what is not as well known is that for every Marine that was lost on Guadalcanal, over three sailors were lost in the waters off of Guadalcanal and what became known as Iron Bottom Sound for the 48 ships somewhere. Final carrier battles, and the biggest one there was the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Uh, considered the greatest, and you can see where, uh, where now the U.S. Uh, industrial machine is kicking in action. Uh, now we've got 18 carriers to, to their four, where for a while we only had two or three of their, their six major carriers. Uh, what, what had happened to the Japanese, too, is they were very, they're, their training for, them, for everyone, the pilots especially, but it was very brutal. Uh, one year they had 175 applicants. They, they accepted uh, 75 and only 20 finished the syllabus because if somebody had even the slightest problem and they're trying to fix it, they just kick them out. You know? so now that did result in a very proficient and very well-trained uh, carrier uh, air group. But uh, the other thing they did not do is they did not uh, send their pilots back as instructors and move a break as did the U.S. So over time, their pilots, they just became uh, worn out and that is with the, uh, the additional attrition and the demand on their training pipeline, whether their training dropped off dramatically. So we experienced them, which resulted here, as you can see now, depending on which uh, reference you want to use, this one says 315 Japanese aircraft were destroyed. I've seen some that says 350 plus, so uh, take your choice. But at any rate, it was a major victory. And um, one of the pilots coming back to the carriers mentioned, uh, well, this is just like an old West Texas uh, turkey. Turkey shoot, so that's how it became known as a Marianas the turkey shoot. Yes, sir. Well, quick question: Where did we get 18 U.S. carriers 18 months after Pearl Harbor? Uh, well, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it right here. These aren't all major carriers, okay? We started cranking out a bunch of small carriers. Okay. We had over 200 carriers by the end of World War II, but they're all different sizes. So I've kind of covered that as we go along. And you can see one 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 lieutenant there down about a plane a minute. 
The last, the last was really the Battle of Leyte Gulf. This was uh, MacArthur's return to the Philippines. Uh, the Japanese, uh, of course, uh, they wanted to, uh, they, they sent their forces to um, try to kick us back out of, uh, out of the landing area up there. I see once again how many carriers versus Japanese carriers. Three of the Japanese carriers were, were, were sunk here in the Battle of the Philippines, or later on the Battle of the Philippines. Let me get, get over here to the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And they only had four carriers at that point. And they were really just decoys because there were hardly any aircraft on them. So they sent them in from the north, hoping to decoy the U.S. fleet up there. And Admiral Halsey fell for it. Uh, he was still smart, you know, we're having been in the hospital for the Battle of Midway, which he missed. So he took off after the carriers, uh, left the uh, San Bernardino Straits unguarded, and a major Japanese fleet went through the northern Straits down to destroy the, our, our landing craft or in the landing zones now. Uh, they, they was led by one of the largest uh, battleships in the world. The only thing that stood between them were five little Navy destroyers and what was called Taffy 3, which were uh, several small, about four or five small escort and, and light carriers. But because of the ferocious defense they put up, the Japanese Admiral thought that he was facing a much larger carrier force and he turned around and went back. So uh, had he continued, he could, have, he could have destroyed the whole landing force. But thank you that you uh, made a mistake there. Then we went into uh, the supersizing of the, the Essex class. These were the most uh, of the, what we call fleet carriers or large carriers. You can see there are 24 of them. Uh, there's not that much difference. One of them is just a little longer haul. Carries a few more airplanes. But uh, they, they were actually, some of them were actually not completed uh, in commissions until after the end of World War II. One of them might be a recipe that I served on a certain Vietnam, but it was not completed uh, there. And the independence class, and this was a, a light carrier. This is where they started uh, building carriers faster. It was uh, on a, a cruiser hull, so it was fairly fast. It was part of the fast air, air uh, task force. Because the advantage of carriers, uh, what they really want is speed out of them, so you can do hit one type of raids, you know, uh, sneak up once you're ready and then get out of town before they catch up with you. And so they were, the, the independence class was very good at that. You can see there's some nine ships in there, and you can see what happened to them. Uh, to the end there, none of them left. They were all either scrapped or, or sold or passed off somewhere else. And then the escort carriers, baby flat tops. These were the real war horses. See, 122 of them. So, you know, that's where we start to get a piece number of carriers, you know, it depends on the size. But these were uh, turned out on freighter hulls. So they could be turned out very quickly, but they were, uh, you know, pretty vulnerable. You can see there it says a max of 30 airplanes on. Some of them had as few as six airplanes. So, but, but their yeoman duty really was in the Atlantic as a convoy escort. Uh, they served well there. And then the Pacific, they would provide air support for the amphibious operations in that island hopping campaign by both the uh, Marines and the, and the Army. Now, a couple of the light carriers back here. Uh, the President, as I mentioned, H.W. Bush, served on one of the light carriers. He uh, flew an Avenger, a torpedo bomber off of that, as, as did also President uh, Ford, also served on one of the light carriers where he was the assistant navigator and gunner officer. And he was also key in helping saving uh, the carrier he was on during uh, one of the typhoons that hold we got into. But um, as I mentioned, uh, Bush was 19 years old. And then at the, uh, at the ripe old age of 20 years old, when he was bombing a key communication facility on Little Island in Chichijima, which is near Iwo Jima, he was shot down. And his, his, uh, during his bombing run, he was hit by uh, an aircraft fire, set on fire, he, just, he delivered his bombs on target, and then he uh, turned the aircraft, maintaining control of his burning aircraft to let his two crewmen uh, bail out. Then he bailed out, landed in the water, crawled in his little raft, and he was uh, uh, he was uh, paddling furiously away from the island because boats were coming out after him. Of course. And then he was uh, he was rescued by a submarine just before he would have been captured. His two crewmen were never found, and that was a memory that haunted him to the, to the end of his days. Now, after he was president, he went back to Chich Chichijima, and uh, so he was standing on. Is that still working? I think I just lost my. Uh, oh, okay. Modern technology. Okay, can you still hear me? <laughs> anyway, he was standing on the bluff overlooking uh, the water where he was, where the submarine picked him up. And standing behind and beside him was a Japanese officer. Was a Japanese officer who had been in charge of the boats coming after him. 
And he told Bush, he says, that when I saw you picked up by the submarine, I thought to myself, my country would never send a submarine to pick up one person. Okay. Now the casualties of World War II, as far as the large carrier, you can see there are 12, uh, 12 total sunk. Five were the fleet carriers, which is the log carriers, and then those little escort carriers that the front of them, along with the Langley, uh, the first one. But the election went down in the Battle of the Coral Sea. The uh, Yorktown, as I mentioned in the uh, uh, Battle of Midway. And then both the Lost and Hornet, oh, those are different battles. Those are around the Guadalcanal there. And then the Prince one was, was the last one to go down. Now, a number of them have been found. Uh, I can find my notes here. In fact, a lot four of them have been found in there. The Yorktown was found down at about 16,000 feet in the water in the vicinity of Midway. Uh, the uh, Lexington was there in the Coral Sea. Uh, the Wasp and the Hornet were both right around uh, the Guadalcanal. And the, the deepest one was uh, down at almost uh, 18,000 feet of water and then anywhere from 2,000 to 18 and whatever they've been found. On the post World War II carrier revolution, first we had the Midway class. She was actually, uh, the Midway was uh, being built during World War II, and they were in a hurry to get her in, so she was built in about 18 months because she was the first one to have a steel flight deck. Uh, the uh, wood flight decks of the World War II carriers were not doing uh, well against the Kamikaze, so they were trying hard to get her in there. However, she was commissioned eight days after the end of World War II. So the Midway class, the three of them there, the Midway, the Roosevelt, and the Coral Sea, uh, you can see they're much bigger than the. Uh, than the previous World War II carriers. And they served uh, for a number of years. Of course, Midway was home ported over in Japan, the first one to be home ported over there. And you can see that the crew got bigger and the flight decks much bigger. Uh, and they were, when they were built, initially the largest uh, warships in the world for about the first 10 years. Now, all three of them did make deployments to Vietnam. Uh, Coral Sea was the most with six deployments, and then Midway with uh, four and AFDR only with one. Now this time, this, this slide was kind of initially titled, you know, what were they thinking? Uh, you can see that uh, we go up, we, you know, we build bigger carriers, and then all of a sudden we build smaller carriers that are less capable. Well, this was a real case of that. Probably has to do with budget dollars would be my guess, but you can see how small it was. It really wasn't capable at all. Uh, they were not very capable at all. They were quickly overcome by the technological, and especially uh, as jet aircraft came into being, there just no way they could handle them. So, uh, they were, like I say, kind of a mistake, but still they were carriers. Now jets uh, required a major revolution to carry aviation because they're, they're heavier and faster. The, the first carriers, the World War II carriers in the Midway class initially were what they called straight deck carriers, which meant you landed right off the axis of the ship. Now the problem with that is the airplanes that aren't flying are parked up on the bow, so you're going right at that back airplane. They'd really like you to stop, you know? So. It's like Midway initially had 14 arresting cables across that landing area that the uh, airplanes could pick up with their tail up. Three uh, small barriers bear could pop up. At the end of that was a big barricade. So you're going to stop one way or the other before you got into the back airplanes now. But the Advent Jet, like I say, you know, the, the, the uh, British came up with the idea of the angled deck. So they canned off the axis of the ship, uh, 11 to 13 degree, depending on the class of the ship. That way, if you touch down, you know, you don't grab a whole one of those arresting cables, you just go around and try it again. Now, it was a British idea, but it took us colonists to build the first one. The Anne Haven was the first one that was built. Now, all of the, uh, about uh, you know, two thirds of the Essex class and all the Midway class were, were originally uh, were modified with that. And you say things never change. Now, we, we hear today about you know increasing cost of, uh, of weapon systems and development. Midway's initial cost in 1945 was $86 million. The second modification where they put on the largest flight deck that's on there today uh, took four years. And I actually asked a friend of mine who was involved in, uh, in ship's overhaul, said, why did it take so long? He said, well, he had some problems. Said, well, what did they do wrong? He said, everything. So they had to redo everything they did. So that, that uh, modification was, was estimated to cost $85 million. It wound up costing $202 million. So, you know, things never change. We're just talking billions now rather than millions. Then we got on to what was called the class of the super carriers, the four stall class. Uh, four stall, of course, was the first in the class. You have four there, Sarah Topic Ranger. 
and the independents, they were much bigger, like 25% bigger, had a lot, lot, uh, lot larger air wing on them, and uh, they, they were they served for quite a number of years. Now the Rangers are uh, very uh, near and dear to me because when we were in the shipyard up in Bremerton, Washington, and that's where I met my wife, so I, I better not forget the Ranger anyway. And then I served at the border as a, as a ship's company, I was a pilot. See where their displacement's getting up, uh, you know, over 60,000 tons and 90 aircraft, so that's a little more than we actually carry today. Uh, initially, you know, some of the carriers used to carry 120 aircraft, did we did initially, but the carriers were a lot smaller, or airplanes were a lot smaller at that time. The other, thing, the other uh, kind of uh, major modification, the initial carriers, the elevators that uh, move the airplanes up from the hangar deck uh, to the flight deck, uh, we're in the middle of the flight deck, which really, you know, would restrict your, uh, your operations on the flight deck. It was just the technology at the time. So these all had the deck edge uh, elevators, so that way you can move airplanes without really, you know, uh, messing up what you're doing on the flight deck at the time. Then the Kitty Hawk, Kitty Hawk class carrier. I started, I, they must have a Kitty Hawk segment right here. They got a couple of them. I, I served on Kitty Hawk too. They were good. They were just kind of an upgrade a little bit, primarily technology. Some still consider them really just the four stall class, but they were very good operating carriers. Uh, see the three of them in here. And they were just a little larger, carried about the same number of aircraft. Well, then it became time to kind of change things here. Uh, John F. Kennedy was initially going to be a nuclear carrier. And then in construction, for whatever reasons, and uh, dollars always comes to mind, where she was changed to a conventional carrier. So she was actually a little, uh, a little less capable on the Kitty Hawk class, uh, but she would have been, would have been the last to burn, you know, diesel fuel uh, nuclear. The Independence was the first nuclear power carrier. Uh, she was in a lot of ways a prototype. She was a class of one. They uh, took eight nuclear reactors off submarines. Submarines that had nuclear reactors. Uh, since about 1955, so she was commissioned in, in 91. So, and she wound up being um, the longest serving commission ship in the Navy at 55 years. Now there are two, two other ships that are actually commissioned that serve longer. One of them is the uh, USS Constitution, which is the big sailing, the you know, square rigger sailor back in Boston Harbor. It's really a museum, but it's still a commissioned Navy ship and gets underway once a year. And the other commissioned ship, and still commissioned ship, is the USS Pueblo. That was seized by the North Koreans out there a number of years ago. It is now a museum in Korea, but it's still officially a uh, commissioned Navy ship. And during the Cold War, of course, the uh, carriers were a key part of that strategy. A shell force with their mobility can chew up whatever. Uh, they have great power projection capability. We can put a lot of ordnance off the front end of one of these things in a hurry. And uh, the defense, uh, defensive systems for the rest of the fleet. And they were a nuclear deterrent because the carriers did carry during the Cold War nuclear weapons. So they, at that time, although I think we always said neither confirmed nor deny, and I think that remains a policy today. You can see down here the USS Randolph was one of about four carriers, I think, that were, responded to the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. We probably all remember that. It wasn't known until fairly recently that that is the closest we've ever come to a nuclear uh, war. There are the submarines, the Soviet submarines, I think there's about four of them down there. Uh, you know, they're small, they're used to operate in cold water, so they're down there in the warm waters, uh, the conditions in them are just horrendous. They probably aren't thinking quite quickly, but the commanding officer of one of the submarines was, was uh, he was sure he was under attack because our destroyers were dropping some small noisemakers. They weren't depth charges, but they're trying to force them to the surface. He thought he was under attack, and he was ready to launch a nuclear weapon. <laughs> now, luckily, you know, um, cooler heads prevailed, and it didn't happen because the results obviously would have been disastrous. But it also showed us uh, the difference in uh, control of our nuclear weapons. You know, in the U.S., they got to have a special message come in. There's two that have keys and have to agree. On a, a Soviet submarine at that time, I built the captain. He could have launched it had he wanted to. So, my brother had to be down there. He didn't know that either. It didn't come out until a couple years ago. During Korea, of course, the carriers were some of the first air power on scene. You can see all the different uh, classes that served up there. Um, what, three quarters of a million tons of ordinary sorties flown up there. They uh, provided uh, air superiority over the North Korean makes, and they also shot down some Chinese makes, which was uh, highly uh, classified until fairly recently, recently too. 
And then they covered when the MacArthur got himself overextended and brought Chinese into the war. Well, they covered the retreat of our ground forces, which were, were uh, lucky to get out uh, as well as they did. Vietnam, of course, we had numerous carrier deployments there. You can see uh, almost 90 deployments. Uh, every class that, that we had served out there. The 1.5 million tons of ordnance, I managed to drop some of that too. We lost over 500 aircraft and 149 POWs. Then we went into the, uh, the nuclear fleet. The, the advantage of a nuclear carrier is fielding. You only have to refuel it once, about, or once every 25 years or once in its lifetime. Now, it does have to go back to Newport News, Virginia to do that. That's the only place we have that capability. That's where we build our carriers today. So it goes back there. It's usually in the shipyard for a year or two because they're doing a bunch of other modifications on it. But they do uh, generate more power. They're, they're faster. And since you don't have to carry fuel for the ship, which, you know, like Midway carried 2.3 million gallons of fuel for the ship, we can carry more fuel for the aircraft, more, more bombs and whatever. And again, uh, you can stay longer. Basically, you can keep them uh, most anywhere by using, uh, you know, unripped ships, uh, supply ships, and you can keep them on station for extended times. So we had her at Carl Benson, I think is still tied up here today. She's getting ready to go on deployment and down there off North Island. And the Ronald Reagan is a home port in Japan. 10 of our 11 carriers today are in the Nimitz class. Uh, Nimitz, of course, was first of the class. She was commissioned in 1975, so she's getting pretty old and getting close to retirement. And that's going to make me feel really old, too, because she was the last carrier that I served on. But uh, you can see 10 of them in there. Their displacement has moved up again 100,000 tons, so they are big ships carrying about the same number of aircraft. And they are all constructed back in Newport News, Virginia. Now, the war on terror, uh, which is what has happened after the Cold War, there's, of course, been you know, some 20 wars, conflicts, or whatever that uh, the military has been involved in. Uh, the, uh, probably the biggest one is Operation Desert Storm that we all remember, the invasion of Kuwait. And you can see there, there's up to four carriers in the, uh, in the Persian Gulf at that time. Midway was the senior carrier in there. I think we also had two over in the Red Sea. Most of the rest of them listed down there have something to do with Iraq or, uh, you know, the, the enduring freedom and, and that sort of thing. Southern Watch, of course, the Afghan-Iraqi wars, and then there was the uh, case of uh, protecting against the pilots off Somalia and, and uh, uh, in the Indian Ocean. Now, the future of the aircraft here is the Ford class. Uh, we have one in commission today. She's been uh, in commission quite a while, hasn't uh, deployed because there have been, there have been some problems. There has a major technological change, and that is that uh, rather than using steam for the catapults, uh, they're using electromagnetic. Just like when you go into the, you know, into the, into the parks and they, they fire you up in the roller coasters. Same, same principle. It's also used for the, uh, for the weapons and the aircraft elevators. So it is going to be more reliable, uh, and even though it is more reliable, you know, and your nuclear power, steam still is the, the medium that drives things because the nuclear reactors have a steam generator attached to them, and then in the case of uh, the Ford class, what you're going to have to do is generate a lot more electrical power. But it's actually lighter; it's easier to maintain than the steam. The steam was 850 degrees, you know, 600 psi, so that was pretty nasty stuff. To be, and they have uh, two uh, new, uh, newly designed reactors, so they get 25 more cent power out of them in the Nimitz class, and um, so they can go faster. And you can see we've got three others under construction, so we're going to have another John F. Kennedy. We'll have the third USS Enterprise. We'll probably have one of those around for a long time in the doors. Of course, carriers have been involved in humanitarian response, and you can see some 200 humanitarian uh, missions around the world, whatever it is. The, the one that comes to mind for me first happens to be down there in uh, USS Lincoln, the Indonesian earthquake in 2004. I remember listening to the pundits on TV when President Bush sent the Lincoln over there, saying, well, oh, you know, he sends an aircraft carrier. Well, an aircraft carrier is your most versatile platform. You've got a runway on it. You can uh, bring in with your onboard delivery some critical supplies and personnel. And of course, then we send the, 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 the supply ships to keep the police supplied. In this case, they offloaded a lot of their air wing and, and put on a helo so they could heal the stuff ashore. The crew was eating uh, with uh, paper plates and plastic utensils so that all the fresh water they make can go ashore. And of course, the carrier shows up with a full, what we call a, you know, a, a, well, it's a full a hospital. You know, 
and uh, it's got at least two operating rooms in it and we're fully staffed and then you can quickly you know up, up the staffing there so you can handle more of that a couple others on here that uh, were interesting now uh, operation frequent wind was the fall of Saigon in 1975 two years after we pulled out of uh, Vietnam the uh, Navy had an armada of 55 ships off there including four carriers Midway being one, but in about 20 hours, when, when Saigon's airport came under attack, the uh, ambassador gave the order to execute Operation Frequent Wind, which still stands as the largest HEAL evacuation in history. In about 20 hours, over 7,000 refugees were, were lifted from Saigon to the ships on shore. 3,000 3, of those came to Midway. And then Midway's last was Mount Penitobo. She was back off uh, Desert Storm, was uh, sitting in Yakuza, getting ready to come back here and be decommissioned. When Penitentiary blew in the Philippines, it was the most destructive volcano uh, eruption in history. Uh, you know, it took Clark Air Base out in Subic Base. So Midway was told to get out of the way and go down and uh, you know get the get the refugees on there. The, uh, the head of our dose department on Midway happened to be the supply officer on there at the time. Now, they didn't have one on the ship, so he had to send his, uh, his supply clerks over to the Navy Exchange store to clean them out of everything you need to support women and, and kids and babies and cats and dogs and even one gecko. You know, you always got to have a gecko come with you too. And the, and the entire hangar bay was filled with uh, with cots that they had uh, for the people to sleep on until they could get them, get them off the Navy place. And of course the last there was Ronald Reagan at his home port in Japan when uh, they, they had the uh, earthquake and with the tsunami in uh, Japan in 2011 which he provided assistance there. So getting down to what we consider our all-stars, the uh, USS Langway, of course, has to be first since she was the first carrier and was key to development. Although as a covered wagon, you know, she was very limited, but still it was the test bed for flight operations and led to, to the rest of the carriers and initial training down there and was scuttled after she was bombed down in the vicinity of Australia. For the Boxer, we haven't talked about her before. But she was the first carrier with an all-jet uh, jet aircraft uh, in 1948. She also earned eight battle stars, and battle stars are what they gave her for particular <coughs> performance in a particular battle. So she had eight in uh, Korea and then two in Vietnam, and she was down in one of those down the Cuban Missile Crisis one that I think believe it was for. And then uh, was also recovery, uh, you know, the first NASA and Apollo missions why they, they parachuted in the Pacific, so she was one of those there to recover that. Number three, the Ranger, and I didn't put it up there. I didn't make this up, so this isn't mine. Okay, <laughs> but uh, she had uh, 13 battle stars in uh, in uh, Vietnam, and of course the most important thing down there was the original Top Gun was uh, was filmed on Ranger. You know, <laughs> so uh, you can't ever forget that. And of course we have the, the recent Top Gun Maverick that's just coming out now. They also used her for a couple things uh, for the uh, anniversary of Doolin was raided. They put some uh, B-25 Mitchell bombers on there and locked them off. And then her last combat was in Desert Storm in, uh, in uh, 1991. The Enterprise, this is the original Enterprise, the most decorated ship in World War II. There were 20 battle stars there. Uh, she was also the first carrier to sink an the, sink the enemy warship. It was actually one of the small submarines off of, off of Pearl Harbor, just after part of Pearl Harbor. And she was in her, every major battle, with the exception, as I said earlier, of Coral Sea, because she just couldn't get there from uh, launching the duo over eight. And you can see how many planes and the ships uh, she shot down. Now, she was heavily damaged in the last battle off Okinawa. Uh, she was brought back and repaired and then used for bringing some of the troops home. And she wound up being scrapped. Uh, Admiral Halsey tried real hard to get her to the museum, but she wound up being scrapped. Now, probably not too surprising, number one is the USS Midway. It has something to do with what's on my shirt here, probably. But uh, as I mentioned, it was the first one with the with an uh, armored flight deck or steel flight deck. It was the first one too to launch a German V2 rocket. We had uh, captured several of the German V2 rockets after World War II, and a Navy wanted to see if he could launch one off the ship at sea, so they selected Midway. They sent her down to Bermuda, set it up in a vertical launch position, and they fired it off. Well, initially, it tilted over and headed at the superstructure, the island superstructure, almost hit it. <laughs> Narrowly missed it, but uh, a few a few minutes later they detonated the rocket and, and uh, well we called it a success you know because it wasn't it was the uh, well it was almost a disaster but not quite. Now the uh, three thousand and, and uh, I mentioned a frequent wind. Uh, 
There are a couple of really interesting things. There are first some of those, uh, about the 3,000 come back to visit now. And not long ago, we had a uh, middle-aged Vietnamese lady and, and an elderly one on board. And the younger lady was just a very small child when she was evacuated in the Midway, so she really had no, no recollection of the experience. But when she got down to the best decks with the distinctive pile pattern, or style, pile pattern, she recognized that, and she broke down in tears. The first sovereign territory that her feet touched of her newly adopted country was the deck of the USS Midway. And in the middle of this evacuation, there was a young, uh, young pilot came flying a little observation airplane uh, down the flight deck. Now he had no his little O1, just a little bitty thing. He had no radio communication, so he dropped a, a note on the flight deck which said, uh, if you move those helos, I can land on your runway. So they shoved some of the helos over the side. After he landed, he got out of one seat. His, his wife got out of the only other seat. He opened up the curtain, the curtain on the back of the airplane, and four more children crawled out. So you can, you can imagine the terror they must have felt in that cramped, dark place. They were unable to even see out for two hours, having no idea you know, what, what fight that might await, uh, await them. But uh, they've all become U.S. citizens, quite, quite successful doctors and wonders. There's also an uh, audio recording of that, and it's done by one of our lady docents. She was a Vietnamese, she was 15 years old when she was evacuated in Midway, so hers is a very heartfelt story of that experience and what this country means to her. There are five different carrier museums. Uh, Yorktown, back in South Carolina, is a National Historical uh, Landmark, and uh, almost all of them have a big outreach program. Like they, uh, they have uh, something like the whole 400, and this is all pre code 400,000 visitors a year. But they also reach out and have educational programs so with kids on board, some 40,000 kids, I think, a year. The Hornet is up in Alameda. Unfortunately, where it is, it's hard to find, so it's not as a visit as we like. You know, if you get across the Bay of San Francisco, it'd be a different story, but politically, that's never going to happen. Uh, the Intrepid in New York is, uh, has or had pre code about a million visitors a year. Uh, location down there counts. And she also has uh, outreach programs for both leadership and uh, kids programs. And then the Lexington down in Corpus Christi, which is, uh, you know, kind of out of the way a little bit. And of course, the most popular, as you might know, and location is everything. So the location of Midway right down here on the waterfront makes her the, the most uh, successful museum. She's the only one that's actually surviving on her own. Uh, the rest of them are kind of in trouble. You see how many guests we have here? And uh, of course, TripAdvisor thinks that we're the thing to come do. We have a, you know, over, well, we had, I'm not sure if we know the number now, over 800 volunteers that are actually kind of a lifeboat there. And we say that because we don't get paid, so, you know, it saves on the cost quite a bit. All the different aircraft, the Battle of Midway Theater, if you do get there, it's a great little flick. It's uh, titled Voices of Midway because it talks about the, the personal aspects of it uh, rather than just the battle. And a bunch of, uh, before COVID, our educational program there used to have uh, 54,000 kids a year come through there. And uh, it's just starting to get up to speed again. It was always sold out two years in advance. And then there's the foundation that, uh, that makes grants out to uh, especially veterans type of form. So it's, it's been a very uh, successful museum. We hope to keep it that way. So this is just a quote from, uh, you know, Vice Admiral, uh, the centennial is just to, you know, honor the legacy of the carrier and also really the sailors that, that served on the carriers because that's what makes any ship who serves on it. Now, I also have to make a pitch, because they had this one on, for volunteers on that way. We always need more volunteers, okay? Like everything else with COVID, we've lost a number up there. And there's all sorts of anything you'd like to do, we have we have a, a situation for it, if you will. Of course, docents that I mentioned are safety personnel, um, ships and aircraft restoration, they do amazing jobs. One of the, one of the uh, Wildcat fighter, that hangs in front of the museum down in the hangar bay. It sat in uh, Lake Michigan for 50 years and then was pulled out of there, brought down to a restoration facility over here at Port Island, where they just do an amazing job of restoring and maintaining our aircraft. I mentioned education, of course, the exhibits. We have, uh, I don't know, 60 or more exhibits there that, they, that the volunteers maintain. You have services, and one that is not on there is a uh, Midway Library. They are excellent. I've used them on a number of occasions. Uh, you know, if it can't be found, I go find it. So, anyway. I got a couple of videos here I'm lined up with. Let me see if I can get out of this to start with. The first one is a pretty somber one, but it kind of uh, 
who goes to the sacrifices that were made during World War II. This happens to be, uh, it's an Avenger torpedo bomber. It was during the Battle for Manila. And it was down on a bombing run, it was hit. Uh, when it got back to the ship, it was so badly shot up, it was never gonna fly again. Uh, it had a crew of three, the pilot and the bombardier did survive, the rear turret gunner did not, and he was so shot up that they weren't gonna be able to get him out of the airplane, so the decision was made to bury him in the airplane, and it's the only time in the U.S. Navy's history this has happened. a little more upbeat uh, you'll all recognize this song it's been around for a while it just happens to be the best uh, version of it I've ever seen
Folks, thanks for having me. I'm leaving here right now. I had over there for the afternoon. Anyway, thank you very much. Anybody got any quick questions? Yes, sir. I just have a quick comment. I had a friend who was a mathematician and scientist with Naval Electronics Lab, and he had to go out on the Kitty Hawk for a week having to do some project. And the main impression that remained with him was the constant noise 24 <laughs> 7. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. If you don't like noise or, or you know, uh, don't don't be up here. And if you like your privacy, you know, you got uh, yeah. like um, midway 4,500 sailors, it's 1,000 feet long, so you can't get more than 1,000 feet away from you know, 4,500 of your best friends. So, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? All right, well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.